Okay, well, uh, today we are going back to visit uh, a subject we started last week. And I wanted to just uh, uh, ask you to remember how we concluded last time. And uh, there were some very interesting comments and some of them spurred me to a little bit more thought. And uh, one of those uh, discussions we've had, uh, I think maybe Surya Murthy spurred it on and then uh, uh, Bertie had brought in some perspectives on it. And if you remember, uh, we concluded with the remarks that, you know, there is a need to focus more on love and not have to necessarily uh, emphasize the subject of sin. Now we are dealing with sin, that is section 13 in our book. Uh, and so we last time discussed what is sin. And then uh, there was this brief discussion on, you know, the, what is the need for us to be too obsessed with sin? Uh, we don't need to mention it too often. We need to be more focused on love. And yes, I do agree that the focus on love is more important because the scriptures have a greater uh, volume of, you know, mention of love and who God is uh, rather than sin. But nevertheless, uh, as I was thinking about it, uh, I feel that we need to appropriately emphasize sin, not uh, obsessively, not excessively, but appropriately. So the question is why? Why should we talk about sin? And the reason I would like, you know, I, I am convinced of is that the Christian faith and the, and the scriptures uh, state that sin is a serious matter, right? Um, sin is not something to be dealt with lightly. Uh, it should not be just a casual interest on our part to understand sin. I feel the scriptures does enjoin us to understand this whole aspect of sin as much as it is possible in a, in a very serious manner because the Bible definitely and, and sharply defines sin. It does not dilute the concept of sin. Uh, and uh, I don't think the Bible wants us to, to misunderstand the whole concept of sin. Now, one of the reasons we need to do this is I believe that the, it is the Bible that brings perhaps a more, uh, what shall I say, uh, a more a comprehensive perspective on sin. If you look at most other philosophies, schools of thought, uh, even different faiths, sin is not as defined as we understand it from the scriptures. Uh, in some philosophical thoughts, in some maybe faiths, sin is completely ignored, right? Uh, they don't talk about sin at all. And they don't like to talk about sin at all. Uh, and I think uh, in some schools of thought, they talk about ignorance rather than sin. Okay. Um, in some other faiths or philosophical thoughts, sin is only limited to an act, right? Rather than a state of being. If you remember last time, we did do a, a fair bit of discussion on that. So it is only relegated to just a, an act. And if you can just try to avoid the act, you are okay. So that is how sin sometimes seem to be described uh, in other, uh, you know, other teachings. I believe that uh, sin is perhaps, uh, there is an attempt, I should say, to minimize the seriousness of sin. And that's what the Bible does not do. And that's the reason why I feel that, once again, an appropriate mention and study and understanding of sin is necessary. Now, in today's age, this day and age, uh, in our postmodern thinking, in our thinking that, you know, of relativism, that everything is relative, uh, nothing is absolute, 
right? There is no absolute standard. There are no moral absolutes. Uh, in this mindset, in this world, people will not like to talk about sin. In fact, lots of people find fault with Christianity. And even as I was just mentioning to you about history of Christianity in India, one of the things that Christians are accused of is that we talk about sin too much and we call people sinners. And of course, that is unfortunate. Uh, we, we don't have to go, you know, uh, you know, accusing people. But there is this uh, accusation against Christians that we talk about sin too much. I was just reading an article written by uh, a pastor. Uh, and the title is What's So Bad About Sin? And it's very interesting uh, some of the thoughts he brings out. I'm just going to quote him from his article. Uh, and this is what he says. One of the common criticisms we get as Christians is that we are obsessed with the subject of sin. People say we are always carrying on about how evil everyone is and trying to make them feel bad about themselves. Some would even go so far as to suggest that Christians are guilty of being anti-human because our talk about sin insults human decency and undermines human dignity. Our critics say that we slander the noble human race when we speak of human nature as being inherently twisted, corrupted, or inclined toward evil. We are accused of hurting people instead of helping them, no doubt out of a cynical desire to manipulate them by creating feelings of guilt in order to win more converts. <laughs> so, uh, so there is this feeling that uh, we sort of use the concept of sin manipulated to make people uh, you know, feel bad about themselves or maybe scare them and frighten them to be converted. Uh, now, that is how I think uh, some people tend to, you know, view sin. But this author also goes on to say that the need for us to mention sin, I think, is, um, is paramount. And he gives the example of, let's say, uh, you know, uh, someone going to the doctor's office. Uh, somebody is sick. He goes to the doctor's office. He gets the the doctor orders diagnosis. The diagnosis is done. And the doctor finds maybe this person is terminally ill, right? Uh, he's probably don't have much time to live. Now, what does the doctor do? Does the doctor hide the fact that this guy's got a terminally ill disease? Does he not mention this so that he doesn't hurt him? So that he doesn't offend him? Uh, and so if you look at it from that, from, from that reason, uh, I think the doctor would be uh, failing in his duty to talk about the condition of the patient. And similarly, I feel that if we are going to preach the gospel, to have no mention of sin obviously may not be uh, expedient and obviously will be falling short of what we are, uh, what the Bible, you know, talks about the human condition to be. And that's where I want to focus on this condition of humanity and the need for us to talk about that. All right. So I believe that I've made my case that uh, there is a need for us to talk about sin. And I'm going to now uh, take some time to do that. And so this today we are going to once again spend uh, time in question number two. I'm not sure if Sachin has, uh, 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 yeah, okay, he's going to share the screen with us. So let's launch into the question number two. We will read through it and then I want to pick up some thoughts and uh, basically answer the question why is sin so bad? And that is the, also the question that is being asked. Let me read and you can follow along. The Bible associates sin with the devil, whose work Jesus came to destroy. 
Sin results in damaged relationships, suffering and death. Sin in act, word, or human or, or, or thought bears false witness to the character of God and is rebellion against the good and right purposes for which God created human beings and their relationships with one another and his good creation. Out of distrust and unbelief in God and his word, we sin in our attempt to live as if we could justify ourselves having no need for God's uh, goodness, grace, and mercy. Acting out of unbelief, sin amounts to living the life that we can have life and being apart from God, as if we could be God's too and for ourselves, and as if we could gain life from sources other than the living God. Sin slanders God's holy character, trustworthiness, and good purposes for human beings. Okay, uh, so that's there's a lot there, but uh, I want to pick up a few thoughts and specifically go into this question of why is sin so bad? Uh, I think, uh, Sajin, you can go ahead and close your uh, share uh, share screen. Yeah, and what I'll do is. I'll, uh, you know, uh, have 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 the discussion. I will quote from the answer, and uh, you can follow along. One of the points there is sin is associated with the devil, whose work Jesus came to destroy. Now we won't go into uh, the dev the devil aspect. Uh, maybe we can do that another time. Uh, but we are specifically focusing on sin. Remember, uh, and notice it says, Jesus came to destroy the work of sin, the effect of sin, the influence and the destructive nature of sin. So now I want to ask the question, if Jesus came to destroy, you know, sin, then it is important for us to understand and know what it is, isn't it? So what did Jesus come to destroy? And for this, I want to go to the book of Luke chapter 4. And I want you to notice how Jesus explains or puts the, or, or describes the human condition influenced by sin. Luke chapter 4, I'm sure you'll remember that famous quotation Jesus makes from the book of Isaiah. And I want you to notice how Jesus Christ explains the condition, human condition. I'll begin in verse 16, Luke chapter 4. He went to Nazareth where he had bought, been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now notice those adjectives, right? How he is describing the human condition. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And of course, then you know what happens after that. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them today. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Obviously, we understand and know that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the role that was given to him as prophesied by Isaiah to come and do something about this condition that Jesus Christ was describing. How does Jesus Christ describe this? Now, I did do a sermon on this uh, that was uh, in the last uh, Asian worship celebration. And I did go into it at length. I won't go into it length, but but let me just pick up a few thoughts from the uh, the discourse of Jesus. Notice he he the way he described the human condition. He says, "Good news to the poor. There is a poverty we are all suffering. A poverty that is not just physical in nature, but a poverty that uh, that." Uh, 
uh, pervades the spectrum of life, even the emotional, even the relational, even the spiritual. So there is a poverty that we have been, we have descended into. We are robbed of a certain richness. And, and what has done that? Sin, obviously. And so notice those, uh, those uh, you know, adjectives. He goes on to say, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, right? There is a captivity we are under. We are like in chains. We are prisoners locked up. That is a serious condition. And some of us really don't understand that. We don't know that we are actually locked up. We are thinking we are free, but there is a captivity that we are struggling with. We are in a certain kind of a prison situation which needs, uh, which where we need freedom. He goes on to say, recovery of sight for the blind. There is a blindness which, with which we exist today, uh, making us, or, or we should, I should say, robbing us of the richness of those things we are unable to see, right? So Jesus came to take away that blindness and to bring us into the light. You could also, you know, uh, use the metaphor of darkness. We are in a, we are in a darkened place. We are, you know, like uh, groping around, trying to find our way, failing, falling, faltering. Because of the darkness that surrounds us, right? He, and then he again brings in the metaphor of freedom to set the oppressed free. Not only are we in a prison situation, but we are oppressed. And the oppression is seen in so many different ways. It is not just an oppression of darkness and sinfulness. It's the oppression of one another. The sin influences us to oppress each other. Right In families, husbands oppress wives and vice versa. Children are oppressed and sometimes children oppress the parents. The oppression is widespread. Look at the kind of oppression, you know, some totalitarian governments do. And just today I've been hearing of a, uh, almost like a, uh, you know, um, a massacre that's taking place in, in, in one of the countries in Asia. Uh, the unfortunate imprisonment of a section of people. So the oppression is indeed so very great. And of course, uh, Jesus says to uh, proclaim the Lord's favor. Now, what is the reason for all of this? Sin. So we can't afford not to understand and know this. And so that's the reason why I, uh, I, I feel that there is a need for us not to be ignorant and to understand and know why sin is so bad. Now, Jesus Christ came to uh, deal with sin, right? He came to destroy the effects of sin on humanity. And he demonstrated its effects, the sinful eff sin's effect on humanity by coming in the flesh. And we all understand and know what he had to go through. He took on human flesh to, uh, you know, to absorb the sin of humanity into himself. And we know what was the effect of sin on him. Not that he committed sin, but he voluntarily allowed sin to uh, subjugate him, right? Even though he was God, he decided to give himself into the hands of angry sinners. <laughs> if you, I don't know if you remember, there is there was a, a book written by an author. I'm not sure who the author was. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Right? There was a book like that. <laughs> but interestingly, if you turn it around, Jesus gave himself into the hands of angry sinners. And we know the, uh, uh, the, what Jesus was subjected to. Now, just for us, once again, to understand the gravity of it, I want to go to another prophecy in, in Isaiah chapter 53. And I would like to read through that, you know, some of what was mentioned there. Once again, I want you to look at it from the perspective of 
the seriousness of sin and how it literally is a destructive force. I begin in Isaiah chapter uh, 53 verse 2. And uh, this is a messianic uh, chapter. Uh, this is, in other words, written about the coming Messiah, a prophecy about the Messiah. And we know that Jesus fulfilled it in his uh, you know, human life. In verse 2, it says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So this is a basic description, description of Jesus. Now notice what Jesus had to suffer. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Verse 4, surely... He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. I want us to understand you, you notice how sin has a devastating effect, you know, and Jesus showed it in himself. Uh, what I want you to understand is this. God does not overlook sin. Right? Uh, he does not overlook sin. God understands the seriousness of sin. And if he could have his own son come and suffer the consequence of sin. We must understand that God has taken a very serious view of sin. And of course, we understand and know that God's love for us is so great that he doesn't want us to go through, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the devastating effects of sin. So that's the reason why perhaps, and once again, uh, some speculation here, uh, Jesus Christ had to suffer so brutally. Maybe one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons could be for us so that we can understand the devastating effects of sin. Right? Uh, gee, you know, lots of people have asked me and even non-Christians sometimes don't understand the whole crucifixion aspect of the Messiah. Oh, why couldn't God just forgive? Why does Jesus have to go through all this beating and, you know, and all of that? And there is a significance to that. We, can't, we should not ignore that. We should recognize it, that sin is serious. It has a, you know, a, a, a crushing effect on humanity. So I hope this uh, helps us to understand that we cannot take a casual view of it. Right? We cannot just, uh, you know, sort of sweep it under the carpet or look at it uh, in a way that uh, is not the way the Bible help, uh, wants us to look at it. Now, uh, let me pick up uh, one or two more thoughts from the answer. The answer in the answer, it also says, sin in act, word, or thought. Uh, 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 as that phrase helps us to understand, it is not just an act, it results in an act, but it's a state of being. And I think we did go through that quite extensively last time. So uh, if I can just bring up some thoughts on that, you know, in other words, just getting rid of the act is not sufficient. And this is where the seriousness of sin is, in, is important for us to understand. Why is sin so bad? It's not just the act that, you know, uh, that we need to be concerned about or get rid of, uh, you know, there is something, there is a deeper malaise. Sin has or affects us with a deeper malaise. It's not just the act, <laughs> talking about just the act, uh, you know, somebody in a humorous way 
said the following. He said, don't think that by giving up drinking, you go to heaven. You go to, you, you just go to hell, to hell sober. That's all. <laughs> right? uh, in other words, uh, uh, sin is not just, you know, an act that you give up. There is something much more inherently bad about sin. Okay. And uh, if I can just, Dave De Silva has sent me a, a, a chat uh, message. He said, Jonathan Edwards is the author of the book, The Sinner in the Hands of a Living God. Okay. Thank you, David, for mentioning that. Uh, yeah, that should be an interesting read. So, uh, sin is an intrins intrinsic, corrupting, decaying in influence. You know, in the book of Romans, let me just go there uh, and read to you from uh, chapter 3. And I will just make some uh, you know, explanations on that. And this is a familiar verse for us. Romans chapter 3, I think it begin begins in verse 10. Notice... Uh, we are told by the apostle, none is righteous. See, none is righteous. So you notice the human condition is not just not being evil, but there is no righteousness in us. And that is one of the problems of the human condition. He goes on to say, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. Notice that no one seeks God. That is the effect of sin. You know, sinfulness influences us to bear false witness to the character of God. It is a rebellion against the good and, and righteous purpose for which God created human beings. So we don't seek God because of that sinful condition. The, uh, the verse goes on to say, all have turned aside. Together they have gone wrong. In other words, sin, it is, it is describing sin amounts to living the lie that we can have life apart from God, as if we could be God's to and for ourselves. This is, I'm just taking out these explanations from the answer. But notice it says all have turned aside. Why do we turn aside? Why do we turn aside from God? Well, that is the corrupting influence of sin. Um, okay, so that is Romans chapter 3. And so once again, it shows that the inherent, uh, uh, or rather sin being, a, uh, sin is a state of being much more than just being an act. All right. I'll pick up one more thought from the answer. And uh, after this, we should go in for some discussion. All right. In the answer, it says, sin slanders God's holy character trustworthiness, and good purposes for human beings. Right. Now, sin, it says, slanders God's holy character, trustworthiness, and good purposes. Notice, sin is not just an act. It is a, it is a, a way of thinking. It is a way of a lifestyle. And why is this serious? You know, why is it so serious that we understand that Sin actually slanders the holy character of God and his trustworthiness. Because God is the very source of life. Right? It is in him, as in the book of Acts, it says, in him we live, move, and have our being. In other words, without God, the whole universe collapses. It is he, he upholds the universe. He created it and he upholds it. So God and Jesus Christ in particular is the very source of life. And here is what is important for us to understand. Sin negates our very existence. Right? It turns on, it turns against the very source of our existence, God himself. See, that is why sin is serious. And the way the Bible is explaining it is so very sharp. And hence, for us to understand, uh, you know, its reality. So, the influence of sin is destructive. And that destruction is permeates into not only ourselves, but it seeks to injure others. It hurts us 
and uh, eats into our well-being. Sinfulness eats into our very well-being. You know, it's like a snake eating its own tail, ultimately swallows itself, self-destructive. Right? So sin actually is a self-destructive force within ourselves. And hence, the need to get rid of it. And how do we get rid of it? Not by any act of ours. Jesus had to come. And that's the reason. And that, that's once again, all, all evidence to show that uh, there is a very serious aspect to sin which we need to understand. Let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, once again, under the section, Slin, sin slanders God's holy character. Notice uh, how it uh, uh, how we are told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated us, treated, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace? Once again, language that... Uh, you know, smacks of great deal of seriousness. I mean, can you imagine uh, trampling the Son of God underfoot, right? And treating an, an as unholy thing that the, the blood of the covenant. These are all very serious language. And so uh, our, our attitude hence towards sin should be one of very healthy you know, a healthy seriousness being given to it. And of course, as I conclude uh, this little discussion, uh, most of you will remember the writer G.K. Chesterton, uh, and he made an interesting comment. He said, he called the doctrine of original sin the only part of Christian theology that could actually be proved. <laughs> In other words, it is, it, is, it, can, it is verifiable that human beings, I mean, sin is a destructive force. And all we have to see is what, is what human beings do, what human beings do to each other. And we are seeing it more and more and more being manifest, you know, in our societies all over the world. Finally, we need transformation. We need a transformation so that we are rid of and free from a sinful nature. And that is what Jesus came to do. He not only destroyed sin, but he went ahead to, in the Holy Spirit, transform us. There is a transformation taking place in all of us. And that is what we call the new birth. Right? Uh, we need to be born again. Because... Our current birth is into a sinful situation and we need a new birth so that we are given a new life altogether, right? So Jesus Christ doesn't just merely save us from sin. He not only cleanses us from sin, but transforms our nature to conform, to conform us to the very image of Jesus Christ. I'd like to read just two more scriptures as we end. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, we are told, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this uh, comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So notice the transformation into the image of Jesus Christ, who is sinless. And that is... Uh, what we, uh, our destiny is finally. And to end with uh, a, chap a verse in Ezekiel 26, once again, a verse that is familiar to all of us, uh, where it says, and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So that all that is metaphorical language. Basically, what it is saying is the sinful nature has to be removed from us. There has to be a surgical intervention 
if I can take the metaphor, you know, a little further, uh, we have to be given a new heart, a new nature. And that happens, of course, finally in the resurrection when we have glorified body. Let me go ahead and stop there. I hope uh, I've been able to demonstrate uh, why we have to discuss sin and uh, the seriousness of sin and indeed why it is so bad. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. Open up for discussion right now. Uh, go ahead and ask me questions or uh, any uh, comments you'd like to make. Anything that sort of struck you? Anything that helped you? I think Sikinda, you raised your hands and then Anil. Sikinda, go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Uh, your voice is a bit low. Can you increase your volume? Uh, try to speak now, Sikinda. Hello? Uh, yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? My voice is not that much high, isn't it? It's not very high, but go ahead. I think we can hear you. Uh, we can hear. Okay, sir. The sin which we commit, whatever it may be, the sin comes again and again because of the circumstances, social life, family life, the public life, the office, where we work. That will be a continuous process, isn't it? Continuous process. How to avoid that? We know that because of uh, framing of the mind, framing of the heart, uh, how to change our attitude. Uh, you said uh, that uh, righteous in, righteousness and we don't seek righteousness, but God will give that, isn't it? God will give that. It is a present from him. Uh, by his grace, uh, he will uh, forgive all of our sins and give us everyday growth in the word of God in which we, in which we travel, isn't it? Okay? Uh, yes, Sikandar, I think... Uh... I could catch most of what you said. You did mention about righteousness. Yes, uh, that righteousness, first and foremost, we don't seek it because of the condition we are in. But you rightly said that righteousness will be attributed to us. The righteousness of Christ will be attributed to us. And that, of course, will, uh, you know, uh, finally free us from the slavery to sin. But we cannot directly ask God to give us righteousness. We only at the end of on the uh, sin end we have to be there because we go on uh, recollecting our sins and should not do it and life should be in a perfect way. Perfect way in the sense in a godly way. In the word of God, God says you follow me. You are next to me. That is we have to go to the standard. The attitude of God has to come into our heart. Okay. Am I okay? <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I understand this. Uh, maybe what you're saying is it's a process. It's a process towards, you know, uh, becoming more and more righteous, becoming more and more, uh, you know, conformed to the image of Christ. But maybe I should just mention we are not in a position to reach a state of perfection in this lifetime, right? Perfection is only in, uh, in the resurrection, you know, when we have resurrected bodies. But when we recognize all the sins and realize it, that itself is a perfection. We, are, we go on traveling in that uh, path, isn't it? Towards God. Towards God means towards righteousness. That is there, isn't it? Yes. Have I improved my audio system? Have uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a still poor. It's a, still a little poor, but it's okay. We, 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 we caught your, the gist of what you say. <laughs> Thank you, Sikinda. Very uh, interesting thoughts. Uh, uh, Anil, you had a thought. Yeah, no, you mentioned uh, Ezekiel 26, I think, right? About the heart. I think there's a, the parallel uh, verse, which I think basically the rationale for sin is uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, 
the heart is deceitful above all things who can uh, this desperately wicked who can know it so i think why we sin is because our heart is so so evil and and that's what needs to be changed uh, yes uh, th- that is a very good comparison uh, anil yes i think uh, it fits in with ezekiel 36 the heart mm-hmm. is so desperately evil and wicked that it needs it it, it it's not just you know uh, you know some pills we take and and make it right we need a complete transplant <laughs> and it is done in jesus and and ezekiel 36 talks about that yeah that's a very good comparison yeah. uh thank you very much for joining us but once again i hope this in this particular uh, discussion today uh i was able to help you understand why we as in the christian faith believe that sin is a very uh you know a significant concept which we need to understand because there is uh, the, the the bible does have very sharp thoughts on it okay so uh, thank you again and let me see anil could you lead us in a closing prayer sure <clears throat> let's pray <clears throat> almighty god we are so very grateful for this time and opportunity you give us every week to listen to your word to discuss your word and to learn from your word father lord continue to inspire us open our minds more and more lord we know that your word is very deep lord and we don't fully understand everything but to the extent we can please open our minds and our hearts to accept it father and to think about it and god as you have said we are not supposed to be just hearers but doers of the word so help us there father and continue to bless all of us who are able to attend and even those who are not able to attend father and may you continue to inspire us inspire the speaking the hearing and the fellowshipping father and lord as we go about now please dismiss us and help us to be lights in the world father thank you so much lord we pray and ask this all in jesus holy name amen amen and thank you again and uh, wish you all uh, a very good uh, rest of the day